in this episode of Outback Coroner. I think we're going to see a lot of emotion today. Their style was very risky, but very successful. It's just a mystery to me. Did something accidentally happen to them? Did fair play happen to them? Memories are affected by trauma. Close your eyes and the world goes black. If something bad happened to one of them, then something bad was going to happen to the two of them. You can't even consider being in that position. What do you say to the families about that? Australia is a country of extremes, from the wilderness of the island state of Tasmania through to the red centre and the tropical north. Geography alone presents coroners with unique challenges. The reason I think that the coroner's court has remained in existence for about 800 years is it deals with unexplained death. The death of any one of us is the death of part of our community, and the community demands to know why they die. Northern Territory Coroner Greg Kavanagh's jurisdiction is the size of Western Europe. Coming up is an important case that looks into the deaths of three celebrated architects. It's been described as a terrible tragedy. Three award-winning architects were killed in a car accident involving an airport fire truck in 2011. From Darwin in the top end, we travel to the southern island state of Tasmania. In my area, possibly 5% of the matters that I do would go to a full inquest. Steve Carey in Tasmania is one of 12 magistrates who handles coronial issues. His next case involves two men who went missing at sea. Police are holding out little hope for two fishermen missing in rough waters in Tasmania's far southwest. We must uh, determine when, where and how they died and whether any person contributed to their death. Two different coroners facing two different tasks. Darwin has always been unique. Once, it was like a big country town populated by people who'd run away from down south. As the city has boomed, so has its style. And one expression of that is its architecture. Recently, Darwin was deeply shocked when it experienced a profound loss. I've just got to put my tie on and go down to court. Northern Territory Coroner Greg Kavanagh is about to explore the deaths of three cutting-edge architects who died in an accident at an intersection on the outskirts of the city. Council Assisting's about to come and see me, Dr oh, Peggy Dwyer. Really good barrister. I work well with her. I think we're going to see a lot of emotion today. These people were fantastic at what they did as designers and and uh, architects and uh, very well known. And every life's important, but uh, there'll be a lot of interest today. It's not your normal court process. It's my inquisition and my investigation into what happened, why it happened, and what we can learn from it. Down Coroner's Court is now in session. Mr. Wire, who's independent counsel, her job is to get to the truth of what happened and not let uh, perhaps uh, other lawyers who are sometimes wanting to protect their clients' interests get in the way of that. OK. Peggy. Your Honour, this is an inquest into the deaths of Kevin Taylor, Lena Yali and Gregory McNamara, three vibrant, gifted architects who were close friends and colleagues. On the morning of the 7th of August 2011, those three friends lost their lives when their Mitsubishi Triton four-wheel drive was hit by a large green air services emergency vehicle. 
The driver of that air services truck, Jack Norris, and his colleagues were unharmed, as was one of the passengers in the four-wheel drive. That passenger was Phil Harris, one of the original founders of Troppo, an innovative architecture firm. Miraculously, Phil walked out of the wreckage physically unharmed. So at about 8.25 a.m., you headed out from the apartments that you've been staying at at Parap. Yep. And I'm reading from a statement which you have prepared to assist the coroner. It was dated the 7th of August 2011. Have you had a chance to refresh your memory from that recently? Um, I haven't been able to bring myself to reread okay. the, um, uh, that document. I, um, I went over it a number of times and, um, and at that time I'm happy with what's written. Phil Harris founded Troppo in collaboration with Adrian Welke in 1980. The company grew from there. Troppo's innovative style led to many awards and respect around the country. At some stage, Greg McNamara and Lena Yali came on board. Yes, the partnership. Yeah. After I went uh, back to Adelaide and Adrian uh, was wanting to, for family reasons, uh, to get back uh, to Perth, Adrian identified Greg and Lena as being perfect people to carry the pattern. Why was that? I think uh, Greg and Lena's record speaks for itself. And as I said to the families post this accident, in many ways, Greg and Lena out Adrian and I. In their early 40s, Greg McNamara and Lena Yali were married with two children. They were a generation younger than Phil Harris and Kevin Taylor, but they had very much of the same unique approach to their work. They met through university, the both were studying architecture, and I guess because they both had passion for it, they sort of uh, drawn towards each other. For me, Troppo in Darwin is Greg and Lena. And I think Troppo should be very proud of um, what they've managed to establish. And anything Greg built, he wanted it to blend in with the environment. He hated air conditioning, things like that, so he wanted to build places where they were created to make the most of the environment they're in. So be it the breeze flowing through a house, so that you would sit in the environment comfortably. Greg was driving the car, is that right? Yes. He was driving a car that he owned? Yes. A Mitsubishi Triton? Yes and Lena was sitting in the front passenger seat of that yeah. car, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, you were in the back seat of the car, you were behind Greg, and then behind Lena was Kevin Taylor. Mm -hmm. Kevin Taylor, 57, was one of Australia's leading landscape architects. He collaborated with Troppo, but he founded his own highly respected company with his wife, Kate Cullity. TCL is a hugely prestigious company that's made major contributions to urban and landscape design in cities and national parks around Australia. I think Kevin had a great mix of skills that put him right up there as a very important person and designer within Australia because he was able to make change. Together they transformed the city of Adelaide when they redesigned over a kilometre of the city's major thoroughfare, North Terrace. It was always seen as being really important that this was the premier boulevard of the city. Air Services is a government-owned corporation that provides emergency response in the event of aviation accidents. After the Darwin crash, Air Services Australia commissioned five major reports. Even though the reports made some criticisms, Air Services offered them up in full to the coroner. While the organisation has cooperated with this program, its staff felt they wanted to preserve their privacy. Well, it looks impressive. Air Services' vehicle of choice is this one a Rosenbauer Panther Mark 8, weighing in excess of 30 tonnes, the same sort of vehicle involved in the accident. My immediate reaction is, that's not enough lights. 
I hadn't appreciated how different this truck was. How big they were, how dangerous they are, how heavy they are, and how that they can go through red lights. Not built to be going through suburban intersections, really. That they were lime green. As a local resident, uh, it's time that we were, we were all alerted to this. Fatefully, on the morning of the accident, the Panther Mark 8 was summoned off airport to attend an extremely poisonous fire at a factory on the edge of Darwin. The Mark 8s are designed so that you can drive right up to a fire and fight the fire from within the cabin. That's correct. And you carry huge amounts of foam to suppress aircraft fires. Yep. 9,000 litres of water it carries and 1,500 litres of foam, so yep. Hydrocarbons like styrene foam and the sort you find in aircraft fires. Yes. Uh, do they give off toxic fumes? Absolutely. That are dangerous? Very dangerous. Yes. So it was the Wishart Road fire, did that have dangerous toxic fumes? Absolutely. As the fire engine rushes to avert disaster, another one is about to unfold. Tasmania is very much a physical place. And on a per capita basis, we perhaps have more wilderness deaths, more marine deaths than other jurisdictions. The Tasmanian jurisdiction is smaller than the mainland states, so they don't have a dedicated coroner's office. As a result, 12 magistrates stationed around the island look into matters requiring coronial investigation as they arise. Some of those coroners specialise. All marine deaths are all directed to the one coroner, Steve Carey. I put my hand up and said, look, I'm very interested in maritime matters. And the chief coroner asked me if I would be responsible for deaths at sea. Many of the cases, the body's not recovered or it happened in circumstances where there were no witnesses. It's always difficult in any coronial matter. You see the friends, you see the family, and for something like that to happen, it's, it's very traumatic. Yeah, it's very, very traumatic. You see accidents and uh, it's a feeling of there for the grace, because you know you've been out there yourself. Why did it happen to these people and, and not you or not someone else? They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Steve Carey has a major case coming up that involves two missing cray fishermen. Their boat was found abandoned in a remote part of the coastline with $46,000 worth of live crayfish on board. Was this an accidental death? Or was something more sinister involved? As the Tasmanian coroner looking into maritime deaths, Steve Carey has had his own experiences that show how easily things can change at sea. There was an incident where we're coming through what they call the narrows, where there's waves break on a, a bar. I had some guests on board with me that I was pointing out the surf and the beach, and that moment of not concentrating, realised I'd got myself in between the, the break. If you can imagine that going over on the whale, where the gunnel is, you, you see the top of the side is actually down digging into the wave as we're going down the side of the wave. So it really was sobering to realise that no matter where you are and what you are, a moment's inattention as a skipper, um, you can put people's lives at, at risk. And uh, it was a great uh, wake up for myself. With $46,000 worth of live craze found on a deserted boat, Steve Carey has more questions than answers. This is a typical rock lobster or crayfish fishing boat with, with the pots. And they will either fish from the mothership or they may use their dinghy or their tender and from the preliminary and breed through on the, Mr Wayman's matter, it's apparent that they were actually setting or retrieving cray pots from their dinghy. 
when uh, the accident happened. So their style and method of fishing was very risky, but very successful. Tim was young and he was cocky and he was, he was confident because his style of fishing reaped him the rewards. It was good money. It was really good money. But it is, it's dangerous. It is, it is a very dangerous job. It's exploring the nature of that danger that lies at the heart of the coroner's investigation. Jake Murphy was fishing in the same area as the missing cray fishermen, Tim Wayman and Ben Clark. We both left about the same day. Tim on the Christie Lee, me on the Aladdin. And uh, we were heading for Port Davey. It would take them 17 hours to get to this pristine and extremely remote area of southwest Tasmania. Once there, the fishermen dropped anchor and left on their dinghies to sink pots closer to the rocky shore. We had some really nice weather for three days, so Tim stayed down at a place called Flat Island and caught some really good fish down there. Later that afternoon, bad weather was moving in, and Jake joined Tim and Ben on their boat. Ben cooked a big feed of steak and veggies, a couple of beers with tea. I don't tend to drink, so I was having my coffee. I did have a, have a whiskey with them later on in the night, just the one, and it seemed strange that I, I even had that whiskey because I don't tend to drink at all. <laughs> and then that was it. It was about 11 o'clock, so they dropped me off. They went back to their boat, and, and that was the night. That was the last time Jake was to see his mates. I've got up at about 5 o'clock in the morning to head up to where I had my gear, and you're sort of looking three or four hours to get your gear on deck. Finished about 8.30 in the morning, and by that stage, I had nothing to do for the rest of the day, so I thought I'd call around and see what Tim and Ben are up to. As Jake got closer, he saw there was no dinghy on the side of the boat and no sign of the fishermen. You know, they should have been finished by that stage. From where we were anchored, I steamed out, just looking for the fellas. Jake searched all afternoon, checking with the skipper of the only other boat in the vicinity, but the two fishermen had disappeared. I cannot think what would have happened to the fellas. It's just a mystery to me, a tragic, Absolute tragic event. It's got me buggered now, you know, I, I just cannot think what would have happened. Did something accidentally happen to them? Did foul play happen to them? Um, or did uh, they do something deliberately um, to harm themselves? To answer these questions, the coroner needs to know more about who these men were. Tim Wayman, the skipper, was the fourth generation from a family of commercial fishermen. We knew he was going to be a fisherman from day one. Like, I was seven months pregnant around the coast with him. So he, he's a water baby. He just would go up to the boat with his dad. He just loved it, loves boats. He was my kind of person. He was a goer. There wasn't a thing that he couldn't beat me at. <laughs> and, I was, and I was supposed to be able to show him. He was probably one of the best dinghy handlers I'd, I'd ever seen. He could make a dinghy talk, and, and you could uh, catch a lot of fish out of the dinghy. However, Ben Clark had only been fishing for one year. He'd spent most of his working life as a builder. Yeah, well, ben and Tim, one of a kind each of them, you know what I mean? Everywhere you went, there was a laugh. I guess they were in their prime. They were loving it. They were out at sea by themselves, making money, doing what they loved. They were best mates. If you're living on a boat with someone, you have to get on. And they, they were best mates. Foul play seems unlikely, but the coroner can never be sure without a body. If you have a body, you can have a post-mortem. So at least you, you have more chance of being able to determine their cause of death you can be more comfortable that there hasn't been any um, foul play at all. 
the coroner will have a better understanding of what happened when he knows the circumstances of how the boat was found. We got the call from a fishing boat in the area. He said something's gone wrong. At dawn on the 18th of June, 2012, the Tasmanian Police, Marine and Rescue swing into action. They face bad weather and extreme cold. The west coast is a, a very remote area. You can see there's no roads, towns, anything out there. It's very, very remote, which provides a logistical challenge for us. What we try to do is to maximise our asset deployment whilst there is time frame for survival. So the first thing we do is get the helicopter going, because that's the one resource that we can get there quickly. We flew down to Port Davey and we were in contact with the fishing vessels that had reported them overdue. They told us that they'd located the dinghy. It was in a gulch in Point Lucy. It's actually up in that one there. And you can see the dinghy, the outline of the dinghy's in the foam. The boat looked like it had been jammed up in there fairly hard. There was a fairly big swell on that day, probably four or five metres. Due to the rough seas, they could only send in a pair of divers with snorkels. It was only possible to do it with mask and snorkel because of the swell. You could really just do a surface swim to see if there was any gear, ropes, or any sign of um, possibly a body. The vessel was quite heavily damaged, being pushed into the rocks, but there was no signs of life jackets, safety gear, or, or, um, or fishing gear. It was all all gone, yeah. By day three of the search, the Van Diemen arrives with scuba divers who were able to search the ocean floor. By that particular stage, unfortunately, hopes were fading very, very fast. Um, the weather had been extremely rough. The water temperature was about 13 degrees, which is particularly cold for down here. In certain water temperatures, uh, life will, will cease, and we, we passed that. The police went down and started searching and they didn't find him in the first two days. I knew there was no hope because the boys would have got ashore. If they had been still all right, they would have got ashore and they would have stayed ashore because they knew people would have been looking for them. Although they have no remains, the search continues. Can the coroner give some certainty to the families of the missing men? Northern Territory Coroner Greg Kavanagh is the longest serving coroner in the country. He handles the stress of the job by pursuing other interests. Recently, he and his wife Ronnie bought a horse. He's a big fella. It's a cart horse. Mr. Ed. It's Mr. Ed. It's a really big, grey old man like me. Beautiful boy. Beautiful boy. Well, you have to have a, a, other outlets. You need support. You need other interests. You want me to hold him? Sure. Okay. Thank you. That's my job, holding the bridle. <laughs> I love it. We've got uh, my gardening. We've got this wonderful horse we've just bought. I might start riding again. But uh, it's a great job. But you need other interests. Uh, otherwise, it will weigh you down. Each day, you're on show. Occasionally, I get grumpy uh, and uh, let myself down, but you're on show. And it's a show that's uh, important for a lot of people. But they, don't, they don't want to see a grumpy old man or a spiteful old man or a, a, a nasty old man or even a subjective old man who uh, uh, is not doing the right thing. I'm going to go to work, love. Love you. Love you. When the four architects set out that Sunday morning, they were intending to visit Weddell on the Elizabeth River that flows into Darwin Harbour. The Northern Territory government was running a design competition for a new, green, sustainable city to be built there, and they were collaborating on an entry. I take it that as four friends and colleagues, you were chatting away in the car as you were heading to the site? Yeah, it was a um, beautiful morning. So we deliberately took the sort of tourist route 
pass Charles Darwin National Park because the Waddell site through the Elizabeth River fringed uh, Darwin Harbour. Kevin had never met Lennon before, as far as I recall, so um, there was a fair bit of introduction around that, but we were all talking very much about um, the way of nature in the top end. When you left the airport, were the lights and sirens on on that vehicle? Yeah, when we proceeded outside the airport gate, lights and sirens were on. Had you ever been called on as a driver or an operator to assist in an, a fire with the Northern Neither Territory? This is my first time. Do you have a memory on the 7th of August 2011 that the sirens were on as you left the airport? Yes. It was dry season and it was August. Can you remember whether or not you had the air conditioning on in the car? I think we must have because at that speed you have to have the windows up or you can't talk. Okay. So I believe the windows were up. The fire truck come down the hill, possibly around about the speed limit if not more, under flashing lights and I believe to the best of my knowledge the siren was operating. He did have lights on, yes. Could you hear the sirens at any time? No, I couldn't, no. Did you hear the sirens on that vehicle? No. Okay. Can you tell his honour, when your friend was driving the car, did you have the air conditioning on? No, the windows were down. OK. So you were on Tiger Brennan Drive, heading towards the intersection of Tiger Brennan Drive and Berrimer Road. Do you remember what sort of traffic was out there on the morning? It Light wasn't or heavy? hardly a car around when we were driving. It was early, it was Sunday. As part of your training, either written or practical, were you told how to proceed through an, a red light when you were yeah. under lights and sirens? Negative, just under the, uh, just respect the road rules. But in an emergency re, uh, response, we could go through red lights with lights and sirens, yes. And how was it that you learnt that in an emergency response you could go through a red light? Um, it was just common knowledge through the um, through our training, you know. We just believed that we were. I'm surprised there was no protocol in place before this accident, similar to what the police and our own fire service. Yes. And I'm still struggling to come to terms with lime green emergency vehicles. Ordinary members of the public wouldn't know that that's an emergency vehicle. You say in your statement that you estimate you got to the intersection around 8.40 a.m.? Yes. And you said earlier you still don't know why it's 100 kilometres heading yeah, down look, the intersection. I don't know what speed we were travelling at. Um, we were cruising is how I felt it. And obviously from my position in the car I would not be able to see the speedometer. Not that I'd be looking at it anyway. As you approached the intersection, the light had turned red. Do you remember that? Um, my recollection is that the light had just turned red as we went to proceed, yes. By law, emergency vehicles are exempt from stopping at red lights. So did you see the red light as you headed into the intersection? Um, no, I didn't actually. I was more aware of the vehicles um, were safe around me, so not so much the light. Because in your mind, your vehicle was exempt from... That's, that's correct, yeah. You weren't concentrating on whether it was a red or green light? Yes. OK. Are you able to estimate, for his honour, what speed your vehicle was going as you proceeded through the intersection? I would estimate between um, 30 and 40 kilometres an hour. And what were you doing as you approach the intersection? As I was approaching the intersection, I was keeping a strong visual, trying to identify any other vehicles within the area. Are you able to tell his honour how long before the collision you first yeah. saw the Triton? As coming down the hill, all vehicles had sort of stopped. The only vehicle that was still moving was the, um, was the Triton in question. It was travelling at a speed. Are you able to say how fast it was? Uh, I, th I think uh, 100 or... because it was going quite fast and it slowed down dramatically. 
When you say it slowed down dramatically, um, what would you estimate it slowed down to? Probably 30, 30, 40. It, it slowed down. And then I felt, I felt comfortable that he was slowing down to stop. At the same time, I got the all clear from Ashley Williams and, and Richie McKay saying it was safe. Yep, they've stopped, they've slowed down, it's all good. You know, it's safe to go. And I just rolled forward onto the intersection and as we were still looking, I looked back and the vehicle had picked up speed again. As you came into the intersection, did you have any sense of Greg slowing the car down? No, I don't have any sense of car slowing or accelerating. On the approach to the intersection, Greg had the green light? Yes. And the reason I know that um, is because uh, when Kevin called out, stop, stop, and I focused on ahead, uh -huh. I noticed a green light and I could not figure why Kevin was saying stop, stop. The whole thing with the green is that uh, I could see the green light and then the whole world was green. The truck sort of like might have braked and its back end came out a little bit as he braked and um, another car comes through and he was, um, yeah, basically hit, hit, hit yeah, by hit that the other vehicle. Car. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to tell he's on a how long before the accident you applied the brakes? A second, two seconds? I, uh, I, I just can't recall. Okay. Till we came to a stop anyway. Of course people reconstruct. Memories are affected by trauma. I don't think it affects their credibility or their honesty. You can be as credible as the day is clear, but that's a different issue as to reliability. The trauma for all involved is profound. The challenge for the coroner is to find a way to ensure others don't suffer similar tragic events in the future. Coroner Steve Carey's investigation into the deaths of the two cray fishermen, Tim Wayman and Ben Clark, continues. The main thing we have to look at would be, are we satisfied that we can make our determination based upon the evidence that's on the file of the police investigation? Hello, Russell. Could we have a chat straight away or whenever you're free? Sergeant Russell Smith is a Tasmanian police officer who pulls together the full brief on which the coroner will make his final deliberations. Okay, this is part of the file submitted by the search and rescue guys. And this is the, the rock crevice or gulch where the dinghy was found. This is the dinghy that they were using at the time. This was located down on this point here. And you can see it's jammed up into a, a rock crevice. To get up there like that, I would reasonably suspect that the weather would have to have been fairly rough at the time. Jump in a dinghy, that's a massive risk in the first place. If you work off the deck, you can only get a certain distance from the shore before the draft of your vessel pulls you up. Whereas in a dinghy, you can then hit that section of shore that doesn't get worked. The closer you get to the rocks, the bigger the risks are. Good day, Russell. Come on in. There is some inconsistencies in relation to what they were doing at the time. Jacob Murphy reports that they had a couple of stuck pots. If that pot's tangled or fouled on the bottom and you're trying to drag him out, you're basically tied to the bottom. So your risks have gone through the roof. Um, and then if a wave has come along, that, that, that can flip you like that. Could have been anything. Could have been undercurrent, pushed him into a rock. They could have been snagged on a pot, trying to, pu trying to pull a pot and tip the dinghy over. One of them could have fell out of the boat and the other one's just bailed in after him. If something bad happened to one of them, then something bad was going to happen to the two of them because they were the kind of people that no matter what happened, there's no way one of them would have left the other one. They were a team, they always were, always will be. There's also no comment as to whether either of them were wearing uh, safety, equipment. safety equipment at the time. Yeah. 
The coroner just had some more queries in relation to what uh, Tim and Ben were wearing that day. How you going, mate? How you going? Good. That's good. Look, I've just got a couple of follow-up questions um, in relation to Wayman and Clark going missing. So were they in the habit of wearing um, PFDs when they were in the dinghy? And, well, Tim had a, had a jacket that, was, that would double as a PFD. It was yep. a flotation thermofloat sort of a jacket. You didn't have to inflate it, but it had a lot of flotation in it as well, built into it. Ben, any time I can remember him in the dinghy, he'd have a full wet weather gear on. Jacket, bib and brace and, and gumboots. And if he did have a jacket on, it'd be underneath his, his main coat. And so you wouldn't be able to tell whether he had it on or not. We try to learn from each of these um, tragedies and hope by making recommendations that it's less likely that a similar tragedy will occur in the future. One month after the two men went missing, there was a breakthrough. You close your eyes, you hear the sound, which is best I can describe as a bit like when you go to the Cyclone Tracy exhibit in the museum. And the sound of the tin scraped across the uh, roadways of Darwin. It's the sound of metal and the glass going everywhere and you close your eyes and the world goes black and you imagine that after the sound stops, fire. And um, anyway, the sound stopped. I opened my eyes and uh, nothing had turned over, nothing had caught fire. Uh, it wasn't a very pretty scene in the car. Um, and I was still worried about fire, so I um, hip and shouldered the door, which surprisingly gave. And uh, there was diesel and glass all over the ground, and I stepped away. Um, then I thought I was gutless stepping away, so I went back. But. When you did see the green vehicle, did you recognise it as an emergency services vehicle? No. It looked more like an office building. At, at any stage during the time you lived in Darwin or travelled in Darwin, had you seen one of those vehicles on the road? No. Did you hear any sirens? No. And I take it then that you didn't see any flashing lights on any vehicle as you approached the intersection? No. One of the things that bugs me, and I haven't, um, as I go over that day, I, I still can't remember if the light was on um, whilst all the time I stood there. Honestly, can't. I think that people would understand that Kevin was my husband, my soulmate, the person I spent every day with, all day. Um, so I, I don't feel that I need to go into that in any more detail mm. um, or to express my grief mm. any further. As a designer herself, Kate Cullity had some points to make to the coroner about her visit to Darwin Morgue to view Kevin's body. We were taken to the back end of a hospital to walk through a car park full of dumpsters where there were weeds growing and signs saying, beware radioactive equipment. It was like going into a prison. We then had to view Kevin's body behind glass. I don't understand why that had to happen. There is something completely wrong about having to view a loved one through glass. Have you continued to work for Air Services after the accident? Um, I'm still employed by Air Services, but I've been unable to work, yes. This accident has had a huge impact on you and your family, is that right? Yeah, it's changed my life, yes.
This goes right against what it says on my badge. My badge says rescue, you know? It's a really nice feeling when you've trained to help someone. I just felt helpless this day. Um, I've met some of the family members, and, and they're so strong. They've been kind. Um, yeah, this is just, just, this just gutted me, yeah. It's uh, just an emergency services, uh, emergency personnel's worst nightmare. Once someone has been in the ocean for more than a week, the chances of finding them are minuscule. It was extraordinary news that four weeks after Tim and Ben disappeared, a body was found nearly 40 kilometres from where they went missing. We received some information in the morning from a fisherman who was in the area of Southwest Cape, who told us that he'd found a body floating in that area. Fortunately, he was able to give us a Latin long where the body was. So we steamed down there as quick as we could because I was conscious of wanting to make sure that the body was still there when we got there because it's somebody's loved one and that's a priority for us if nothing else um, is, to, is to be able to recover it, identify who it is and, um, and give somebody some closure. Who's that? Ben. What's he doing? Being the board of fish. fish. And we still had hope. So we worked out on the maps, it's about 45 kilometres to the nearest gravel road. And there is, there is some bushwalking tracks down through Port Davey <clears throat> and some old huts and that. And we still had hope that they'd be walking out. The police actually rang me and said they'd found a body, but they didn't know who it was and it had to be, yeah, identified. That's just a really hard one because Either way, one family was going to miss out. Working alongside Russell Smith is Adele Reynolds. Hi, my coroner's office, Adele Reynolds speaking. I became involved from the time that we recovered the body. The first step was to advise coroner Carey that a body had been recovered from that area. Thanks for that. Right that. Cheers. Coroner Carey orders forensic pathologist Don Ritchie to do an autopsy. As a forensic pathologist, our chore is to determine the cause of death in individuals who've died, usually suddenly or unexpectedly. We then prepare a report that the coroner uses in making his determination. Whenever you find a body, there's a possibility you can find a cause of death but we can never be confident as to that because of decomposition. The body had been in the water for four weeks. It was uh, in an advanced state of decomposition. There was relative preservation of the body in the legs and pelvis because there was clothing on that part of the body. We elected to do both DNA and dental for identification to get the quickest result back. Toxicology was helpful in that it ruled out illicit drugs or other drugs. But because there was so much decomposition, we were not able to arrive at a firm conclusion as to what's happened to this man. Once identification is confirmed, Adele Reynolds contacts the families. It was one of those cases that when I rang up, like, what news do you want to hear? You know, you can't help but put yourself in the family's shoes at that point. Like, do they want? to hear that it is their loved one in the circumstances, you know, what's good news, what's bad news. I mean, you can't even consider being in that position. It was 10 days later that they actually contacted us and said that it was Tim. Um, you're not supposed to lose your children. That's... For Ben Clark's family, however, there is no certainty. And people pass away regardless of whether it's of an illness or an accident or anything. You get to lay their, their body to rest. You get some closure. I've got nothing. I've got nothing. Tasmania is very exposed, especially the west coast. So the danger is nature and the risk is being caught 
in the circumstance where the vessel you're in or your ability to control your vessel doesn't match the extent of uh, nature that you're facing. Coroner Steve Carey has determined a public inquest is not needed and has decided to hand down his findings in chambers. Mr Wayman and Clark were obviously engaged in fishing activity that could be described as pushing the limit. Professional fishermen are remunerated based on their catch. Mr Wayman was acknowledged as achieving better than average catches and this may have been due to his preparedness to take greater risk at times than others. Setting the cray pots close in shore at a time of the year when weather conditions were likely to be less than ideal most likely created circumstances that eventually led to the incident that caused their death. I recommend that professional fishermen take the time to identify the risks associated with any of their activities. Taking the time to consider the circumstances in this particular case may have avoided the tragic outcome. Are you able to indicate to His Honour what the speed of the Mark 8 vehicle was as it entered into the intersection? Uh, I calculated a minimum speed of 48 kilometres per hour. You identify the primary cause of the crash as being human error? Yes, that's correct. Okay. That was the error of Mr Norris to fail to identify the movements of the Triton prior to it entering the intersection? Yes. And secondly, the speed that Mr Norris entered into the intersection with the vehicle was too fast in your view? Yes. Care yeah, services has been fantastic in their uh, proactive approach, but they let down uh, the community and their own employee, yeah. Jack, uh, Jack Norris. I can, I can recall he was a rugby league hero in this town, one of the toughest men, and he hasn't been able to go to work for 12 months or so. Air Services recognises, doesn't it, that its training was inadequate to equip its drivers in dealing with emergency situations in the community off airport sites? There were deficiencies in the areas of driving the vehicles off airport and also driving the vehicles under emergency response conditions. And what do you say to the families about that? I express my sincere regret to the families about that at the time. Air Service does recognise the training program at the time had significant deficiencies and I offer my sincere regret for that particular time. Danae, could you just tell us your full name? Uh, Danae Rose Taylor. The coroner asked the family members to address the court and reflect on their loved ones. Look, Lennis, my little sister. Always will be. She might have been small in stature, but she was pretty big in heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. We'll adjourn uh, pending uh, findings. Uh, thank you. So at the end of the day, you're trying to give a lot of people some closure on their grief. And that's the process. And, uh, well, that's what we're trying to achieve. In the matter of an inquest into the deaths of Kevin Taylor, Lena Yali and Gregory McNamara, Australia has lost three brilliant professionals who, in my view, contributed an enormous amount to architecture and landscape architecture in this country. This accident is not the fault of Jack Norris or his crew. I have no doubt, had Mr Norris been given the appropriate training, the accident would have not occurred. Had he been trained, for example, to slow down to a speed of 20 kilometres, he and his crew would have had more time to assess the Triton as a hazard and more time to stop to avoid a collision. In my view, there's little doubt that Air Services Australia has responded to this tragedy in a thoughtful, thorough and determined way. And I am confident the organisation will do everything possible to improve their off-airport safety procedures so that they may continue to offer their firefighting skills in our community. The coroner made further recommendations in regard to increasing public awareness of the Rosenbauer Mark 8 should it be needed off airport. And he also recommended a grief counsellor should be attached to his office.